Ah, the most wonderful time of the year, in my opinion. A major international tournament, the Euros are back in the mix, and that means I'll be back to making daily videos for you guys during the tournament. That tournament grind set is my favorite grind. And the Euro coverage starts right here. I'll have two quick preview videos for you, relatively quick. Groups D, E, F in this one, and then the previews for groups A through C will drop in about 48 hours on Thursday. And then next week on June 11th, I will release my predicting the entire Euros video. Every place in every group, then the knockout rounds, and the overall winner of the tournament. I did that for the World Cup a couple of years ago, and it was a really fun video. Got the winner, right? So yeah, that's all the programming you can expect from me over the next month or so, guys. Daily recaps and discussion, some watch-alongs, and of course, preview videos for the knockout rounds as well. Also, guys, this is not an ad. But if you're a fan of trivia and you want to take me on in football trivia, use the link in the description to download FC Quiz and join the Rabona TV community. You'll be able to see how you stack up against myself and all the other FC Quiz users in the Rabona TV community. And there will even be Rabona TV specific quizzes on there tied to some of my uploads. Join me, it's free. Use the link in the description to download FC Quiz and join the Rabona TV club or search for Rabona TV in the club section to find us and prepare to get rocked by me. Group D is a heater, man. This is a group that is going to see a very solid team fall or simply go through in third, I guess. <laughs> I really love that more countries get an opportunity to play with the expanded format and you get some great stories out of it, but the concentrated chaos of the best 16 teams from Europe fighting for the cup was pretty cool. But anyway, back on the rails here as we look at Austria, Poland, France, and the Netherlands. Roland Koeman is back, baby. He left the Netherlands to go to Barcelona. Things didn't go stupendously for either side in the meantime time, though that 2022 World Cup with Van Gaal wasn't bad. But now Koeman and the national team are reunited and things are looking pretty good for them as they move back to their 4-3-3 style that Koeman had implemented before his Barca break. Though he did switch to a back three against Germany in a friendly and in a few other matches as well. So I think he's going for a more dynamic, we can do it all kind of approach. Many teams are like that these days. Although things may also be looking frustrating for them as they shared a qualification group with who else but France. Can't get rid of these dudes. You hate to see it, eh? France slapped them 4-0 in their first meeting, then 2-1. Netherlands have a ton of talent at the back with Alexa De Ligt, Van Dijk, Ake. Danger in the wide areas from Jeremy from Pong. Dumfries coming off of a good season again. And of course, creativity in the middle via Xavi Simmons. Frankie de Jong's absence is massive if he doesn't recover in time. But the big question is in the striker position. Does Koeman continue with Weghorst or switch to Brabi, who despite Ajax's struggles, still scored 22 and assisted 12 this season? Gakpo played as striker for Liverpool. Depay is still around. No Josh Xerxy though. So some great options and you'd expect Netherlands to advance, right? No predictions here, just general vibes of the group. Speaking of vibes, France has tournament winner vibes each and every time they enter a tournament these days, don't they? Final of Euro 2016, winner 2018 World Cup, lose in a shootout to Switzerland in Euro 2020, lose the final on penalties in 2022. By the way, imagine the horror of scoring a World Cup final hat trick and then losing that final. I feel for Mbappe, man. That's nuts. It's nuts. France aren't seen as favorites strictly based on their squad, which are always, you know, insane squads, but also their record at tournaments under Deschamps, a guy who isn't universally loved, but hey man, his results speak for themselves, don't they? Some argue that they make finals all the time in spite of Deschamps' tactics and substitutions, but I think at some point, the record does speak for itself, you know? It's one last kick of the can for Olivier Giroud, who announced he'll retire from the national team after this Euros. Griezmann will still be there running all over the pitch. He'll be in the box, and then he'll be in his own box. Barcola made the squad, and deservedly so, as did Kolomouani, despite not scoring since February 10th, 17 matches ago. Still a quality player, but really bad form. They ran through the group with seven wins and a draw, including that 14-0 win over Gibraltar, which felt like... It was watching, you know, the meathead jock at school stuff a kindergartner into a garbage can. They have shown some weakness, but only in friendlies, losing to Germany twice in the past year in friendlies. But still, tournament France will smash, I reckon. Poland had a funny path to Euro 2024 as they sacked Fernando Santos after just six matches and less than a full year of the man being in charge. And I just want to say nothing. I don't need to say anything besides 
Thank you for Euro 2016. Anyway, because of that false start, Poland had to take the playoff route to Euro 2024 because they finished in third in their group behind Albania and Czechia. In the playoffs, under new coach Probiers, they beat Estonia 5-1. And then in the final, they beat Wales in a penalty shootout, a perfect 5-for-5 five five from the spot in that shootout. Probiers has switched them to more of a back three, whether that be a 3-5-2 or a 3-4-2-1 formation. And so far, so good. The results, again, they speak for themselves. They are yet to lose under the man. All your favorite Poles are in the squad. Lewandowski, Zielinski, Piantek, Zalewski, Kivior, and of course, Matty Cash. What's Jim Dobre? Oh, good morning. <laughs> Poland are in a better place than they were under Santos, no question, but can they advance as one of the best third place teams or even a top two? Not with this next team around, I don't think. Austria, what a story, man. These guys made a mess in qualifying, <laughs> at least if you're Sweden, as their sixth tournament qualifying run came to an end thanks to Austria, who have been improving slowly but surely. I mean, without... Even without big Ralph Rangnick taking over, Franco Foda, one of the best names if you're Portuguese, took Austria all the way with Italy in Euro 2020, where the eventual champions required extra time to defeat them. They finished one point behind Belgium in qualifying with six wins, one draw, and just one loss. Notably, there's a belief in Austria again, who failed to qualify for the 2022 World Cup and were difficult to watch. Gone are the defensive counter-attacking days, and now they are playing much better quality football without any kind of fear now. Hell, they beat Croatia 3-0 in Rangnick's first match. They will have to do it without David Alaba, their captain. Huge loss, unfortunately, for them. But there's still quality in there, such as Marcel Sabitzer, coming off a great season with Borussia Dortmund, Baumgartner of RB Leipzig, the fantastic Konrad Leimer of Bayern Munich. They're quite midfield heavy, but strong in defense as well. I mean, most of this squad is playing in the Bundesliga now. If that tells you anything about how this country's football talent has evolved. I do wonder if goals will be an issue, but they could be a dark horse or at the very least cause an upset in the knockout rounds of this tournament. Yeah. Group E, and like every group in this competition, there could be one standout for the top spot, but the rest is very difficult to sort out. Ukraine, Slovakia, Belgium, and Romania in this one. This is a team that is fun to watch. I mean, at least most of the time I tend to enjoy. <laughs> I won't claim to have watched every single Ukraine match, though I did watch their playoff while I was in Iceland as they were playing Iceland. They obviously won that match 2-1, a late winner from Mudrik, who was threatening all match. In the semifinal before that, they came back late against Bosnia and Herzegovina, Yeremchuk in the 85th minute, and Dovbik in the 88th to win 2-1, 2-1, 2-1 merchants, eh? Ukraine were only in the playoffs on goal difference, actually, as they finished level on points in qualifying with 14. Who are they level with? Italy. But speaking of Dovbik earlier, he's fresh off of winning the Pichichi in La Liga with 24 goals, one ahead of Sorloff, which is a massive boon to Ukraine's attack under head coach Sergei Rebrov, who has lost once in 10 matches. Strong squad, especially in the goalkeeper position with Trubin and Lunin, but you have a strong defense, strong midfield, and an informed striker. I mean, I like Ukraine in this group. Slovakia is a team I watched, I'm not gonna say quite a bit, but given they shared a group with Portugal, I did watch them often, and they always made it difficult for Portugal. That 3-2 Portugal victory in Portugal was not easy, with Slovakia dominating the second half. In fact, their qualifying campaign was super impressive, only losing to Portugal twice, drawing Luxembourg once, but winning every other match. Only conceded eight goals in qualifying, man, thanks in large part to big man Skriniar, no doubt the biggest name in this squad. A potentially exciting player to watch is Leo Sauer, the 18-year-old left winger from Feyenoord who made the most of his cameos for his club. Two goals and four assists from just 274 Eredivisie minutes. So we'll see. That's a random player I'm throwing out there for you to watch. But as far as goals go, I worry about Slovakia. I still think they will make it out of this group. Maybe, but that could be their Achilles heel. We'll see. Maybe they won't. Domenico Tedesco, the man who took the reins from Roberto Martinez, and similarly to the man that preceded him, he coasted through qualifying, as Belgium often do. In fact, he hasn't lost a single match for Belgium. And gone are the days of the back three. They're gone! Belgium have been playing a 4-3-3 or 4-2-3-1 these days. Now, let me tell you what I don't like. Some of their options in defense. I am not over the moon with Jan Vertonghen in 2024. I love Vertonghen, just not in 2024. And their fullback options aren't terrific in my opinion either. And without Courtois in goal, I do worry a little bit about their back end. Back end? What? 
However, what I do like is their midfield and their attack. Great players on the wing, such as Trossard, Doku, Bakayoko of PSV or Luka Bakio, De Bruyne, Tielemans or De Catalada through the middle of the midfield. And of course, Lukaku or Openda as the strikers. I like them going forward, but again, worried about their backside. What? That said, they're making it out of this group, right? Right, fellas? I dare them not to. And finally, Romania, where they were indeed the shock of the qualifiers in some ways, at least. Did their group have any colossal countries in it? Not so much, but it was a very competitive group that Romania went unbeaten in. Six wins, four draws, top of the group ahead of Switzerland by five points. Edward Jordanescu's side conceded just five goals in 10 matches played, which is where they drew most of their power in defense. The most notable player in the squad, after all, is likely that of Radu Dragosin of Tottenham. Other than that, Romania draws a lot of their player base from within their own country, as well as Turkey, a little bit of Italy sprinkled in there via Parma, Palermo, and others. And while I was incredibly impressed with how they navigated through qualifying, this is a massive step up as far as the quality of opponents they will be facing. It will be very, very difficult for Romania to escape this group, even as a top third place side. I wish them luck though. I'd love to see a fairy tale. And maybe all of what I'm saying is just smoke and mirrors for my prediction. And maybe I'll have them in first in the group. You don't know. And finally, Group F, we've got the guys who let everyone down in Euro 2020, Turkey, as well as Georgia, Czechia, and Portugal. Fernando Santos, who we spoke about from a Polish perspective, is gone. Gone is the Santos era, and the Roberto Martinez era has arrived. To be completely fair, and to be honest with you, what was a really nice change was seeing Portugal absolutely cruise through qualifying. That 3-2 win over Slovakia was probably the most danger that Portugal dealt with, and those two goals were the only two goals that Portugal conceded in qualifying, which is quite impressive. 4-0, 6-0, 3-0, 1-0, 1-0, 9-0, and on and on it goes. 36 goals scored, two conceded in 10 matches. The thing is, with the quality Portugal has, they should be running through qualifying like this most of the time. In my opinion, they have one of the best squads, but are constantly dysfunctional under coaches of the past, like Santos. So far under Martinez, not bad. But anyway, all of your favorite Portuguese ballers are in the squad. I mean, look at this list. It's nice. Ronaldo will still likely be the starter. I mean, the guy did just break the record for the most goals in a single Saudi Pro League season. As long as he's in form, facilitating the success of others as well as himself and scoring goals, I have absolutely no issues with him starting. Hopefully the jump from the Saudi Pro League defenders to this won't be too big, but he looked good in qualifying. Other than that, we saw Portugal go back and forth between a back three and a back four and look dangerous with both. So assuming they don't crumble on the big stage, they should be a lock for the knockout rounds and possibly even a really deep run in this tournament. We'll see how they grow. Czechia, Czechia, Czechia. Maybe you know them as the Czech Republic, as I do as well. But maybe you dabble with the idea of calling them Czechia, as UEFA does. And many, in many sporting events, they're called Czechia. Look, Czechia, sometimes I'll say Czechia like you requested. Sometimes I'll say Czech Republic. It's sort of like a vase vase situation. I don't even think about it. It just happens. Anyway, they swooped into Euro 2024 on the tails of Albania. Well, actually, they finished level on points with Albania on 15, but just behind them on goal difference. Ivan Hasek returned as the coach in 2024 after previously coaching Czechia back in 2009. What happened to the man who qualified them in Yaroslav Silhavi? He didn't extend his contract, citing the crazy amount of criticism and hate he received whenever they failed to win a match, and he moved on to coach Oman. Anyway, remember the goal Patrick Sheik scored at Euro 2020 from about the halfway line? He's fresh off of a double winning season with Leverkusen where he was second choice much of the time, but still scored 13 goals from 1500 minutes. So he's in good form. In fact, looking at this Czech squad, they are worthy of your consideration to advance from this group. Quality in all parts of the pitch, really. Deep run, don't think so, but not pushovers. Georgia are in. Georgia are in thanks to how they did in the UEFA Nations League where they topped their group in League C, so they entered the playoffs in the C path and had to overcome Luxembourg, which they did quite comfortably with a 2-0 win. Then, in the final of the playoff, they came up against Greece, the 2004 champions, fresh off of a 5-0 victory over Kazakhstan in the semis and without a single goal scored in 120 minutes, Georgia won the shootout 4-2. Huge! 
their first major tournament in their history, man. So congratulations to Georgia. Great to have you. And of course, the man you will know in their squad is Kavica Kabaraskalia of Napoli, but you'll also know their manager, Rulli Sagnol, as the Frenchman took over the national team job in 2021 and has the highest winning percentage of any Georgian national team manager that oversaw at least 10 matches. So he's doing quite well. He's turning a page. There aren't any other players at the stature of Kabaraskalia in this Georgian squad at the moment. And while they deserve to enjoy this massive achievement of qualification, I think it's fair to say that the chances of them advancing beyond the group stage are slim to none in this group. But we salute you, fellas. Make me eat my words. Make it fun out there. Speaking of manager names, you will remember Vincenzo Montella is the man that has taken over the Turkish national team. Like I said earlier, Turkey let everyone down back in 2020. They were the dark horse, coming off of a hot qualifying campaign. They slumped that tournament. Three losses, one goal scored. Come on, guys. Not like that. But anyways, Montella took over in September of 2023 and won important qualifying matches against Croatia and Latvia, as well as a draw with Wales to lock their place down in Germany. In fact, they finished in first ahead of Croatia in qualifying. Now, what's followed since then hasn't been great, but they are indeed friendly, so take from it what you will. But a 1-0 loss to Hungary, no shame there. Hungary is good, as we will go over. And a 6-1 loss to Austria, 6-1. A lot of youngsters played, but still 6-1. Speaking of youngsters, Turkey has some great ones like Kenan Yildiz. Should he be included in the final squad? I don't know it yet. Arda Guler is in there, of course, as well. Orkan Kokçu, who finished really well with Benfica this season. Hakan Çalonolu is the main dude after a stunning display with Inter this season. And fairly decent in the back line as well. Also, lots of Turkish people in Germany that will be coming out for these matches. So again... Am I falling for a trap with Turkey? Are they going to trick me somehow or what? Are you good or not, Turkey? I need you to decide. Personally, I would like to see them make it out of this group. Turkish fans will add some nice spice to the atmosphere in the stadiums. It'd be good to see. And that will do it for this part one of the Euro 2024 groups. I hope you got some value out of this, as it's always fun for me to go through all of the teams prior to the tournament. It's a nice warm up gets be primed. If you're looking for in-depth deep dives on each and every single team, then my man Michael Talks Football has got you covered. Do go and check out Michael Talks Football on YouTube and his coverage. Tell him Adrian sent you. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you in a couple of days, 48 hours for part two. Take care.